Peter chapter 1, this is where we are this morning, from verse 12, Peter now reminds his fellow Christian brothers and sisters saying, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth, the, the truth you now are, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will so, it will soon be put aside as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and when we were with him on when we were with him on the sacred mountain verse 19 we also have the prophetic messages as some something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts now, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by a prophet's, uh, prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origins in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Just so far for now. Now, last week, or the week before, we spent some time in Peter saying, listen, you've got to understand that you've got to add to what God has given you, the faith God has given to you, you've got to add to that faith, this journey of righteousness that God has called us to, so that we will not stumble. He actually says, so that you will not stumble in any way. He says, and if you grow in these things, if you add to your faith, if you keep journeying and following Christ Jesus our Lord, walking in his footsteps, learning what he wants you to learn. He says, then you will, you will not only not stumble, he says, but you will get to a place, you will, you, will, you will find what he's given so that as you journey, you grow. And as you grow, his authority, his life, his word, his presence just takes over your life to the extent that godliness your true nature actually breaks forth. Paul puts it in this way. He says you're carrying something very valuable. You're carrying a divine nature inside of you. He says, but this treasure that you have, this beautiful, rich presence of God is in a jar of clay. Now, sometimes we want to struggle so much about the jar of clay that we don't want any cracks in the jar. But Peter reminds us, saying in the book of 1 Peter and in 2 Peter, reminding us that you cannot see the glory within if you don't have some cracks in the jar. Hello. Let me explain it in simple context. We cannot see the patience of God's sons and daughters unless their patience are tested. We cannot see the authority and the forgiving nature of God's sons and daughters unless somebody provokes them to be unforgiving. Hello? Yeah, nobody wants to say amen. <laughs> we cannot see how to love the unlovable unless the unlovable is unloving towards God's people. And now it's very quiet. Okay. It's important that we know that it's not about what we can do. It's about who he, us, uh, who he is inside of us. That is what is important. 
And with that reminding us as, as we journey through the first portion of, of 2 Peter chapter 1, saying, add to your faith, goodness, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, uh, uh, self-control, self-control, perseverance, then godliness, then brotherly love and love. Peter says, I'm going to remind you of these things. Over and over in these few verses, he says, so I will remind you of these things, even though you know them, even though you're established in them, even though you stand firm in them, I'm going to keep reminding you. He says, you know why? Because I know that this tent that I live in, this jar of clay is so broken already, but it's going to go away. This jar is not going to last. This tent is going to be folded up. He says, God is going to come and fetch me. He told me, I'm going to die soon. And with the time I have left, I'm going to keep reminding you even of the things you know, because there's nothing new that will save you. It is the truth that is the oldest truth of all that will save you, hold you, and sustain you. So interesting nowadays that even within the church, we're looking for the new thing. Where Peter says, let me remind you. Three times, he says, let me remind you. Even though you know, even though you stand firm, let me remind you. Then he says again, because I know that I will soon be put aside, verse 14. He says, Christ has Christ made this clear to me. Verse 15, I will make every effort to do what? To see that after my departure, you will always be able to do what? To remember these things. Peter says, I'm going to say it so many times that even when I'm dead, you will not be able to forget. Hello? Yes. I'm going to remind you. This is because what happened to you is real. And this God that you serve is real. This gospel is the truth. So, so Peter, what are you reminding us about? Is it is just this journey, adding to our faith and, and growing in righteousness and being strengthened so we do not fall? Peter says, no, it's actually even more basic. I'm reminding you to go even further than that. He says in verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories. I'm not telling you a story. I'm not telling you a fable, Peter says. I'm not just thinking of something I want to share with you. He says, what we are sharing with you is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. He says, and the reason why I can share this with you and remind this, uh, remind you of this is because I haven't just heard this. He says, we were eyewitnesses to this. And then he points to two specific, uh, two specific examples. He says, we were there. We were there. When Jesus was baptized and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved. Peter says, it, 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 we were there in the Mount of Transfiguration. We were standing there, me, James, and John, we were there. And then the Son of God shone like the glory of the Son. And the Father's voice came and spoke and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. He says, I'm not sharing with you something I, d I, I heard. I'm sharing with you something I experienced. I'm sharing with you the glory and the power and the authority of Christ. I know he will return in glory because I saw his glory before me. That is what Peter is saying. Peter is not trying to teach you to ride a bicycle out of a book. Peter's taking the bicycle, riding it in front of you and saying, listen, you see how this goes? This is what you do. Peter's saying, we were there. So I saw this. I was there when I failed. I was there when he forgave me. I was there when I saw his glory and his fullness revealed. And Elijah and Moses standing next to him in front of us. And then just like us. Now if you're like me, you would go, oh, how I wish I was there. Don't know who of you just felt like that, but every time I read this, I feel like that. God, how I wish I could just be there because how, how can you doubt after that? But then Peter says, not only that, listen to this. He says, we ourselves heard his voice when it came from heaven when we were there with him, verse 18. 
But in verse 19 he says, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Now I asked you, the beginning of this service, do you believe, still believe that this is the word of God? Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah? Peter is saying to those that he's speaking to, do not worry. The fact that you were not with me and James and John when we saw this, he says, before us, long before us, David wrote Psalm 22 about him. Isaiah, 740 years before Christ, prophesied that the lamb would say nothing. He would be led like a lamb to the slaughter and the trans- our transgressions would be on him. He said, right through the word, He says, we have the prophets. We have the prophetic word that God spoke over hundreds and hundreds of years. We even know that in Genesis it said that the snake would bite you at the heel, but his head would be crushed by the heel of your seed, the son of the living God. Amen. Peter's saying these prophetic words are completely, come on, preach with me this morning. It's what? It's reliable. And Peter, knowing us, knowing his audience, he knows our conversation in our head. Yes, Peter, it's easy for you to say, you have the mountain and the prophets. We only have the prophets. Peter's saying, listen, you will, be, you will do good to, to hold on to that. How should we hold on to that? Peter says it's completely reliable. Listen to this. He says it's completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it. To what? To every prophetic word about Christ that was written from the beginning and fulfilled at the cross. You will do well to read the story of Moses, see the blood on the door frames, and see how that points to Christ. You will do well to see how the tabernacle was built and the glory of God revealed on the Ark of the Covenant and the, 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 the curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Holies. You will be, do well to read that it tore on the day that Christ Jesus gave his life on the cross of Calvary. You will do well to see every prophetic utterance and everything that God used to show that that everything is about him. You will do well to hold on to it. How should we hold on to it, Peter? Listen to this. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It says there will be a day where you won't have to hold on to anything When the heavens are ripped open and the Son of God arrives in glory, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Everyone that believes now will see him. But let me remind you that everyone who does not believe will see him as well and shiver. We don't say these things anymore, hey? Because it's confronting. But that's not politically correct to say that some will not be saved. I didn't say that. The Bible does. God says, there's only one way to salvation, that's in Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't want to, we don't want to address these truths anymore. Peter says, hold on to it as a light in a dark place. Why is he saying a light in a dark place? You know why? Because the times that we live in, you say, Piet, but that was a long time ago. Guess what? The times that they lived in was also a dark place. They were killed and persecuted for their faith. They had to hold on. Peter said, hold on to every prophetic word, to everything that happened. But then he says, don't only wait for the day when the heavens get torn open. Listen to this. He says, for the light that rises, uh, the, the day dawns and the morning star rises, where? In your hearts. Peter says, just as I know, you can know. 
Yes. yes, then we will know. He says, no, before that, when the dawn, when the day arrives and, and Christ is revealed in your heart and the light rises in your heart, you can know with first-hand knowledge through the presence of the glory of the Son of God revealed by the Spirit of God available to you. You can know that you know that you know. I said, Peter, no, wait a minute. How can we know like Peter? Let me explain it to you this, but just by testimony. A person that knows me very well is not, is not a Christian himself, but asked me after a few years that we knew one another. He, he asked me, and we were coaching wrestling together. He asked me, he said, Peter, why do you do what you do? I said, what do you mean? He said, why do you, why do you believe? Since I've come to know you, you're not, you're not a naive person. Well, why do you believe? Why do you, why do you preach? I said, I can, I can share it with you, but the problem is then I'm going to have to share with you the whole story. He said, are you up for it? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So I shared with him my story. Making a long story short, it culminated... And to a day while I was studying maths in Pretoria, in a youth hostel called Ararat. I don't know who of you know the place. But I was living then and uh, staying there at that stage, studying mechanical engineering, studying maths. A very spiritual subject. <laughs> and while I was studying maths, God showed up. And when I say this, people always ask me, so how, 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 what did it look like? How did you, you know... I'll be honest with you, it wasn't one of those warm and fuzzy feelings. I was too afraid to turn around. I remember moving backwards and just switching off my light and lying flat on my face. And what I later realized was about just over three hours. I was on my face and God spoke to me, showed me my life and asked me if I thought that the wonderful way in which my life played out. People like to uh, proclaim over my life saying, yeah, you were born with a golden spoon, you know, because everything you do just works. If you've got time, you can come and ask me what that was like. But that was my, my life. And God asked me if I thought that that was me. And in that day, he said, now from now on, I want you full time. He says, I want you to stop studying engineering. I want you to come and work for me. This is what you'll be doing. He declared my ministry to me and what the Lord wanted me to do. I'm not going to share with you all the detail. And um, after that, I drove home from Pretoria. Just after one arrived home and told my dad that I would not be going into the family business. So I would be going into the family business. <laughs> And, um, and he asked me, my friend, to remember we're back to wrestling. He asked me, how do you know that that was real? And I asked him this question. I said, you know what? Let me ask you. Before that, I was the only son with five children. The only son. My dad had two businesses, which I would groom to to take over, studied engineering to do that. And that night God changed my life around. I said, now you are speaking to me in Australia about 24 years after that evening. Let me ask you. I'm going this way. God spoke to me. I am still in ministry. Let me ask you, how real do you think that night was? that can change everything. Peter says, when the light rises in your heart, hold on to it. Hold on to that revelation. What you know about him personally, hold on to it. And then Peter says this. He says, because a prophetic utterance, if it's in you, or if it's from the prophets to you, 
It's not just the thoughts of man. It's revelations given by God to them. Isaiah couldn't prophesy Isaiah 53 without the Spirit of God revealing in him what was about to come almost 800 years later. Yes? He says, hold on to that. He says, because these prophetic utterances, your experience with God is as real as it gets. Yes? And then... Peter actually says to them, now, these prophets, these prophetic words were carried by the Spirit. And then Peter, remember, in the letter there was no chapters. So then chapter 2 verse 1 says, but there will also be false prophets amongst the people, just as there will be false teachers amongst you. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me share with you this morning, as real as the word and the clarity of the word of God is. Just as real that in every season there will be prophets of God and there will be false prophets and teachers. Peter reminds his flock, reminds the Christians, reminds his brothers and sisters saying, I will remind you of these things so that you will not forget. Do not forget that this God that we serve is real. This gospel is the truth. Prophecy, God's word stands firm. But do not forget, you will deal with in every season. You will deal with false teachers as well. Now this morning I want to read this to you. Just say to the guy, the person next to you, don't worry. We won't go too long. I see some of you going, we know him. If he gets in the Bible, he's, yeah, he's not going to stop. I want to read this to you. But I want to read this to you in the message. What happens when teachers, prophets, start leaning on their own understanding, start being drawn away by their own thoughts? In the message... It reads like this. But there were also lying prophets amongst the people then, just as there will be lying religious teachers amongst you. They will smuggle in destructive divisions, pitting you against each other, biting the hand of the one who gave them a chance to have their lives back. They have put themselves on a fast downhill slide to destruction. But not before they recruit a crowd of mixed up followers who can't tell right from wrong. They give the way of truth a bad name. They're only out for themselves. They'll say anything, anything that sounds good to exploit you. They won't, of course, get by with it. They'll come to a bad end, for God has never just stood by and let that kind of thing go on. God didn't let the rebel angels off the hook, but jailed them in hell until judgment day. Neither did he let the ancient ungodly world off. He wiped it out with a flood, rescuing only eight people. No other soul voice of righteousness was one of them. God decreed destruction for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. A mound of ashes was all that was left. A grim warning to anyone bent on an ungodly life. But that good man Lot driven nearly out of his mind by the sexual filth and perversity, was rescued. Surrounded by moral rot, day after day, that righteous man was in constant torment. Verse 9, So God knows how to rescue the godly from evil trials 
and he knows how to hold the feet of the wicked to the fire until judgment day. God is especially incensed against these teachers who live by lust, addicted to a filthy existence. They despise interference from true authority, preferring to indulge in self-rule. Insolent egotists that don't hesitate to speak evil against the most splendid of creatures. Even angels, their superiors in every way, wouldn't think of throwing their weight around like that, <laughs> trying to slander others before God. These people are nothing but brute beasts. They are born in the wild, predators on the prowl. In the very act of bringing down others with their ignorant blasphemies, they themselves will be brought down. Losers in the end. Their evil will boomerang on them. I thought that that was very Australian. <laughs> they're so despicable and addicted to pleasures that they indulge in wild parties carousing in broad daylight. They're obsessed with adultery, compulsive in their sin. Seducing every vulnerable soul they come upon. Their speciality is greed. And they're experts at it. Dead souls. They left the main road and are directionless. Having taken the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, the prophet who turned profiteer as a connoisseur of evil. But Balaam was stopped in his wayward tracks. A dumb animal spoke in a human voice and prevented the prophet's craziness. There's nothing to these people. They're dried up fountains, storm-scattered clouds, headed for a black hole in hell. They are loud mouths, Full of hot air, but still they are dangerous. Men and women who have recently escaped from a deviant life are most susceptible to their brand of seduction. They promise these newcomers freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For if they're addicted to corruption, and they are, then they're enslaved. If they've escaped from the slum of sin by experiencing our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then slid back into that same old life again, they are worse than if they had never left. Better not to have started out on the straight road to God than to start out and then turn back repudiating the experience and the holy command. They prove the point of the Proverbs. A dog goes back to its own vomit, and a scrubbed up pig heads for the mud. Amen. <laughs> Yolanda's Bible just started reading. See? Peter takes chapter 2 of this letter to say this he's warning his fellow Christians he says I don't want you to forget this I want you to remember this even after I die just as God's word is true just as God's prophetic voice are secure clear and reliable right throughout history. So in every season, there will be false prophets and false teachers. Peter is warning us, saying, you've got to be careful. It will sound like freedom, but its fruit is division and bondage. Peter says, 
especially be careful when you have just left your old life, still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in your spiritual journey, wanting every experience. He says, be careful. Not everyone has his glory in mind. He warns us about these false teachers. He says, be careful. They've got profiteering in their hearts. They are prophesying for profit. So they won't tell you what you need to hear. They will only share with you what you want to hear. Otherwise, their profit will diminish. I will say that again. If you are dealing with a prophet whose mo motive is profiteering, you will not hear what you need to hear. You will hear what you want to hear, which is two very different things. Peter ends that off by saying this. He says, it's not so difficult to see who they are. And then he uses an example. Two examples, actually. He says, you know what? They prove these sayings true. A dog returned to its own vomit. They spout out what is unhealthy and unwholesome. And they keep returning to the same stuff and the same way of doing things over and over again. Leaving the freedom they received in Christ. And the last example Peter uses, he says, if you wait a while, brothers and sisters, let me be very clear. You can polish a pig, but you let it go and give it enough time, it will return to the mud. Peter says, be careful. You might be here this morning saying, I cannot believe you are saying this from the pulpit. I am not. I just read the word of God to you. Amen. Nowadays we pretend as if, as if the word of God just has beautiful rainbows, bright-eyed little stories and bushy tails and everything is just there to polish us and make us feel good. Now Peter says, when I'm not here anymore, please remember, there will also be some false teachers amongst you. Be careful. As long as our teachers and our prophets of this day, if their prophecies is aligned with the word of God and every prophetic voice spoken right throughout the ages, then we are all reminded that there's nothing new under the sun. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's always been in control and always will be. But when we are looking for profit, then we have to be new. We have to be fresh. Otherwise, our consumerism mentality of our Christianity will move to the next ministry. Amen. Please remember, I'm not asking you to remain or to give. Actually, let's make sure of that. No offering. I know we never have offering. It's always online, but no bag today. Thank you, John. And you don't have to worry that this was about you giving anything. This is about you listening and asking God, God, is Second Peter chapter 2 also from you? Because if it is, let it do what you have called it to do. Let it do 
what you have sent it to do. It's the only thing I ask. Together with me, let's allow the Word to do its work. His Word to do His work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for You. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the fullness of Your revelation to us, in us, and through us. Father, I pray, may You always be the object of our affection. May You always remain the lover of our soul. May our eyes remain on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, I pray for myself as I pray for my brothers and sisters. Help us that our hearts would not be hardened. Lord, we render our hearts to you to do as you want for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.